I've been invited to be part of Project Egress, and the Adam Savage team and the National Air Space Museum are going to be building a replica of this door. They've invited 20 makers to make various parts of the door, and I'm making the hinges, the top and the bottom hinges. All the drawings were provided by the Adam Savage team, by Jen Schachter and the Adam Savage team, and uh, I'm honored to be involved. And I made a 3D printout on my CR-10s. I have two CR-10s, and some of these parts took up to 12 hours to print. I was pretty amazed, and very successful prints for me, but the 3D printing stuff in my world isn't challenging enough. I mean, for me, it was very challenging to actually be able to print these parts, and I learned a tremendous amount, and I love the resource of 3D printing, but I wanted to make it in my own style. And so I decided to use this wood here, I have Ipe wood. This is wood that was left over from the Atlantic Beach Boardwalk. My friend Patrick salvaged it for me, and I have a lot of it. And this was the perfect project for it because I started seeing this project. My buddy Kevin collaborates with me on this project, and Kevin Lazat and I started discussing it, and I said, maybe I make it out of wood. And he said, yeah, I see a little wood and brass. And then I started getting a more clearer vision. But of course, I needed the 3D print to help me at least actualize and see what this was going to be all about and the shape and the scale and the size. And you see here, I a little nervous at first to try and transfer these sizes and shapes to the wood. And it occurred to me, let me just hot glue it directly on the wood. So I made a voluminous piece big enough to encompass the, the part. And I just hot glued it to it and I used the actual plastic part as my silhouette to do my drill patterns and then also to do my bandsaw patterns. Some parts I could just trace onto the wood, but not all of them, like this part. I couldn't actually trace that because the actual 3D printed part is got some air stuff. This one was obviously flat against that. I could have simply traced that. But this was a, a funny, simple method. I'm using a bandsaw blade with a four tooth per inch resaw blade, a bandsaw, and it cuts that, that hardwood pretty good. And uh, since I'm translating all these parts basically by eye and hand, I just have to be super careful and notice where uh, the machine parts are square to the table. And in some cases, you'll notice I hot glue these finished parts to MDF. And that's a way for me to be able to get some of these, these angles in there. And then, of course, the hand finishing with files is extremely helpful. This is a very, very hard wood, so it's easy for me to hand file it. And uh, it doesn't clog up the files, and it just keeps cutting. Now, two similar parts here. I'm just using MDF. And you'll notice those parts are a little complicated to cut. If I wasn't gluing them to an upright piece, I'd have a, definitely have a bit of trouble. I had to make two of everything. So I basically went to school on the first couple of parts on how to translate it. And you see I'm using MDF, and the MDF is just extremely, extremely uh, expendable. Here I just sand it right off. And I use CA glue for a lot of it. I didn't use CA glue to glue the plastic here. I just used a little bit of hot glue. And again, there's parts, of the, those knuckles up there, I couldn't really translate them, so I just used the, the concept of silhouetting. I use a piece of glass and, and uh, Tim Sway's square, and that's how I'm able to translate my lines from the 3D print up to, so that piece of glass basically become a surface plate for me. Here you see how I'm gluing to the MDF as a sacrificial piece just to prop up so I can maintain that angle, same as the original 3D printed part presumably the same as the machine part that was on the original spacecraft door. Another really, really uh, advantage is I have the parts to be able to make sure that each one of these wooden parts that I make interact cleanly and properly with the plastic part. If it doesn't interact with the plastic part, then, then it's wrong. So it's a good thing that I can keep trying and attempting and making sure they fit. And in this case, I'm just getting close enough so that I can then refine that with a with a file and now I'm going to the the two clips at either end of the hinge and it seemed only proper to make them in brass because it would have been too thin to make them in wood <clears throat> so here you see I got blue dicom on there to scratch out my patterns and I had to make four for each side and I just crazy glued the brass together or CA glued and then sanded each one of those hand bandsaw parts 
so that they were basically the same. Drilled them all at the same exact time. And a lot of the stuff was redundant, so I jumped through time. So I drilled three holes in that. I only showed you me drilling one. And so I sanded and yes, I actually drilled two holes in that. And again, I had the 3D part, the copy, so I was just using the 3D part each time. This was a little bit tricky soldering. And I'm using electrical solder, which solders extremely low melt. If this was a real part that was going to be put under stress, this part would all be silver soldered together. And silver solder is very, very strong. Electrical solder is not nearly strong at all. It's really just meant to, to flow electricity through wires. And this is not at all structural. But uh, I did learn a lot of techniques about keeping one part cold while I'm soldering the other part. And that has a lot to do with heat sinking and using a little bit of wet cloth here and there. I didn't really show it. Again, I jumped through time quite a bit because a lot of this was redundant. But I wanted to just show you how and what I did. And you see I'm heating up just the outside of that. Had to be careful. It didn't have any heat sinks on there that time. But just controlling the heat with the, the flame. And I filled in those voids with a couple of pieces of what I epoxied in place there. And just to kind of reinforce this sort of turn of the century steampunk look and this is the upper bracket now it needed two sides on each one of the two brackets so that means four sides and I CA glued them together and I just got them all in the same shape drilled them and then I just I just tapped them apart that's uh, the main body of it and I did a bandsaw cut so it gives me an opportunity to bend right on the bandsaw cut more soldering and you'll notice the bolt hole there is to maintain the sides perpendicularity is that a word perpendicularity and then I can just simply unscrew it and now this is one of the flanges I made two of these and you'll notice me using my bandsaw with my little zero clearance plate which is just a piece of scrap and those big chunks of aluminum became the heat sink on top of those brackets because I didn't want to reheat up the joints at the top part there and you could see a better idea of the heat sink and I had to weld on those little, or solder on those little flanges. And then I had to take them over and drill them, which was a little nerve wracking because I was afraid they might break off. Solder, electrical solder is not strong at all. And so there are the two brackets that get used on each one. And I wanted to soak these when the time was right. I just soaked them in linseed oil, boiled linseed oil. And I just soaked them in there for a couple of minutes at a time just to make sure that they were fully immersed. And then I kind of buffed them up a little bit. Kept sanding them. I kept seeing little moments where they needed to be sanded. Now Kevin Lazard is here to save the day and make the coolest part of all inside of this beautiful piece of engineering. Using my 16 inch South Bend lathe, Kevin machines up what was probably a, a pump that would have slid inside of itself. Kevin likes to use router bits to do chamfers and rounds and it's a really simple simple technique just hold the, the router bit in your tool holder and you can make sure you match the right angle the right cut rather and you see that and then uh, he was using a tool he, he rounded the inside then hand filed it and then there's the finished part at the end of this video I'm going to show you a full-on sped up video of him making that entire part start to finish and just using a little scotch brite to clean that up. Those eventually get chamfered left and right, or should I say milled, to make each one of those ends flat. And so there's the second part. Not quite finished, but finished as far as the lathing is concerned. And then in the meantime, I'm starting to put together everything except for what Kevin's working on. And I made a couple of spacers. We, we got quarter 20 bolts inside of the 5 16th hole, so I had to make some sleeves here and there, a little boring lathe stuff, so I didn't show much of it. The chicken snuck into the machine shop while we were working, so I had to chase her out. And the chicken had babies. We had four babies there, you see. Her two teenage babies and her two adolescent babies there. And this is a little technique that uh, my shop assistant, Brett, uses quite a bit, and so we remembered to use it here. It's called brassing. You heat up anything that's not brass, and you rub it with a genuine brass brush, and that brass transfers onto the metal and so that was one way of getting that one cap nut that one 5 16th cap nut which was not brass the others were quarter 20 that I happen to have in brass 
Got a little desperate. This was a tight timeline on here. Here you see Kevin milling the sides of those, those rounds on both sides, on both ends. And then he turns it 90 degrees. And you see him using the indicators, just the proper way of doing it. He's using an indicator that's on the quill just to make sure that that is perpendicular in travel so that the hole he drills into it is perpendicular. And here Kevin changes out the starter bit <laughs> with the regular bit and he with one hand, so he was very proud of that. And so we drill through both of them. We get them both prepared and ready to go. And Kevin chamfers the holes a little bit with a with a, with a V bit. And now they're ready to put in. And in the meantime, I made the little pegs here and there, the ones that would become the hinge pins for the whole assembly. And we tightened up all those acorn nuts so that that assembly would stay in space. It might loosen up, but again, this is not going to be a properly used or structurally used piece of equipment. It's really just for art. And there's another one of those pins that I made. And now we plop it in. I had the, the drill bit taking its place in the meantime. And then I just CA glued a lot of the pins in place, the ones that were blind pins, which meant there was no other way of keeping them in place. Either we make them so they fit tightly and press them in, or we just CA glue them. Again, this is just a piece of artwork. It's not necessarily a, a going to be a functioning hinge that's going to bear any weight. And there you go. This isn't its full mode of travel. <clears throat> a couple of the parts hit each other, but it seems like they wouldn't hit each other if that pump wasn't a fixed pump, the one that Kevin just made, and it actually sleeved inside of itself. You'd get a little bit more travel. Kevin and I both sign it with some stamps that are period, accurately period to the, to the part. And there I did a little animation. You could see them bouncing up and down. And this was a lot of fun to be involved in, and, and I really am honored to have been asked. And Kevin was super psyched to be able to make one of the key components. So Kevin, thank you. And Adam Savage, thank you, and Jen, and all the people involved at Project Egress. And now here, this is a little bonus footage of Kevin on the GoPro making that whole part from start to finish. And you can translate some of these images to the image of me over his shoulder if you go back and look in the video. At one point, you could see the microphone poking in there, and that's me filming him. And he turned it over, and he centered it. He flipped the piece around and centered it in the three-jaw chuck which of course is important to make it concentric from the other side. Typically you'd use a four jaw chuck so that you could center it accurately. But, and there it is, there's the, the finished lathe part prior to going to the mill. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you Adam Savage and Jen and everybody over at Tested. I appreciate it.